3,000 more homes for Jews in the West Bank and East Jerusalem. The U.S. and its NATO allies have crept closer to the Syrian civil war. The alliance says it will deploy American-built Patriot anti-missile systems near Turkey's southern border to help protect against mortar rounds from Syria, what NATO chief Anders Fogh Rasmussen calls a purely defensive measure. It will in no way support a no-fly zone or any offensive operation. But the announcement also appears to be a message to the Syrian regime amid fears it may be preparing to use chemical weapons. This is IRN USA Radio News. Views and opinions expressed on the following program are those of the hosts and guests and not necessarily those of the staff or management of KLAV. Welcome to Aspects of Writing with your host James Kelly. For the next 60 minutes, we'll explore every aspect of writing, including how to create, format, and even sell your work. The phone lines are open at 731-1230. That's 731-1230 or toll-free 1-866-820-KLAV. Now, let's get right. Here's your host, James Kelly. Hello and welcome to Aspects of Writing. I'm your host, James Kelly, here on KLAV 1230 on the AM dial. On your computer, you can listen to this broadcast live at www.klav1230am.com. You can view us live on YouTube at youtube.com forward slash Aspects of Writing, and Aspects of Writing is all one word. And then just click on the Featured button. Uh, the toll-free number to call into the show today is 1-866-820-5528. The topic of our show today is writing for television, movies, and plays. My guests for today's shows um, as our authors and writers um, Anthony Giordano, uh, James Anthony Ellis, and Jefferson Langley. And in the studio, we also have Jan Corsi, and then we also have Dana Michelli. Um, before we get to our guests, we'd like to start with a segment of the show called Mentoring Jan. And Jan is here, and we're going to actually go over Jan's new editing process with Dana. Dana, are you there? I am. How are you? Great. How are we doing with the editing? I will be done either tonight or tomorrow. It's going very well. Um, it's, I'm at the very end of the book. And basically what I'm doing is I'm trying to kind of set it for the next book and maybe get rid of some information that's not necessary to speed up the pacing towards the end. And as always, it's just a suggestion. And the final word lies with Jan because it's, you know, her baby. and Right. And she is the final say. And we'd like to let the listeners know that the name, the title of her book is The Secrets of Time. And it's a story about a grandfather clock that inside holds all these secrets from 148 years, I believe, correct? That's yes. how long the, the clock had been in the family. Yes. And one of the main characters in the story accidentally in anger hits the clock and a secret compartment opens. And one of those secrets is revealed. But as the story unfolds, not through just the first book, but through the second and third book, um, more secrets will be revealed in more hidden compartments within that clock. Yes. And what's unique about the story is not only are those secrets revealed, but in addition to that, as the characters are developed, they also play secrets within the clock. Yes. So that's a little bit about the story. <laughs> Dana, how do you, uh, is that a good synopsis? Oh, absolutely. It's a great story, and um, it, it definitely um, – is a perfect material for, for a series or, or a trilogy yes. because um, there's, there's so much information there once she finds those other letters that um, you could just, you can go in so many different directions with it. It's fascinating. You know, you can involve the history of it from the, you know, when they lived and because the letters are dating back. So, you know, centuries. Mm -hmm. yes. So, um, it's, there's so much material there. It's excellent. It's like a big box of candy, isn't it? Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't like one, you can throw it out and get another, get another one. one. <laughs> Jan, what have you learned so far with this editing process? Uh, that I should have taken a lot more English in school. <laughs> should have paid a lot closer attention. And thank God for Dana. Because uh, <laughs> um, as good as it sounds in my own head... Once I read what Dana has has changed, uh, it reads so much better, you know. But uh, again, I write; I don't read. Well, I think this is the important part of what we're trying to do, and and let our listeners know on the air is that you know, n no matter how great you think your work is, you always need to get a second opinion. You always need to get someone else to look at that and help you know restructure or revise it a little bit. And it's not just somebody with a second opinion because I've had three other people read this book before I sent it off to Dana. Mm -hmm. And they have made 
some subtle changes. Right. Um, Dana has said, take this and move it over here. Take this and move it over there. Mm -hmm. Take this out altogether. These other three people never made any of those type of recommendations at all. And I've moved some things that Dana has recommended, you know, move this closer to the front of the book, move this to the end of the book. And it reads better, makes more sense. You can see it in your mind's eye. Right. But I think the difference is as well is that the, the people that you um, had look at the book weren't real editors. No, they're not editors at all. And, and that's Dana why is a professional. You editor. need to send it to somebody professional. Okay. Well, too, it's, it's difficult if you know the people personally. It's very hard. I've been in that position. You don't want to tell someone that you're, <laughs> you're friends with or family. Right. You know, it's very difficult. Right, because you don't to want to step on their toes that. or make them right. feel, you know. Right. You know yeah, right. It's, it's very hard. Yes. All right, if you, are, if you are just tuning in, you're listening to Aspects of Writing with me, your host, James Kelly, here on KLAV 1230 on the AM dial. And on your computer, you can listen to the broadcast at www.klav1230am.com. Again, you can watch us live on YouTube. Just go to youtube.com forward slash Aspects of Writing and click on the featured button. My guests today are Anthony Giordano, uh, James Anthony Ellis, and Jefferson Langley. Um, let's see here. Before we introduce our guests, uh, I'd like to read a few fun facts and quotes about today's topic. In 2005, the Writers Guild of America sent out ballots to its members asking each to list up to 10 of their favorite produced screenplays. Once the tally was calculated, from those chosen, 45 were, uh, were original scripts, while 56 were adaptions. In terms of genre, 60 were dramas, 26 comedies, and 15 were comedy dramas. 75 of the 105 films on the list received um, either an Academy Award or Best Screenplay. Uh, that was 39 that has, uh, got a Best Screenplay. And an Academy Award nomination for Best Screenplay were 36. Uh, and I'm going to ask J James Anthony Ellis, are you there? I am here. How are Hi. you? Great. How are you doing today? Awesome. I'm going to let you read the first quote or we have here, a fact. All right. So the, the number one screenplay is Casablanca, done in 1942, written by Julius J. and Philip G. Epstein and Howard Koch. It's based on the play Everybody comes to Rick by Murray Burnett and Joan Allison. All right. And Anthony Giordano, I'm going to let you read number two. Hi, James. Thanks Hi. for having me on. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, number two is The Godfather, done in 1972. Uh, the screenplay was by Mario Puzo and Francis Ford Coppola. It was based on the novel by Mario Puzo. Okay, and I think everybody... Practically everyone's seen The Godfather. Mm -hmm. uh, and Jan, would you like to take number three? Number three is Chinatown, written by Robert Town, one of the premier script writers and director in Hollywood today. And you know we had his niece on our show. Yeah, Jocelyn. Jocelyn has a new film that's coming out. It just finished post-production. It's called I Am I, and I believe she's getting ready to take it to the film festivals. That's who that is. She's exciting. Yeah. And Dana, would you like to take number four? Uh, number four is Citizen Kane, written by Herman Mankiewicz and Orson Welles. All right. And Jefferson Langley, would you like to take number five? Yes, thank you. Uh, number five is All About Eve, screenplay, screenplay by Joseph L. Mankiewicz, based on The Wisdom of Eve, a short story and radio play by Mary Orr. Okay. And my first guest today is Anthony Giordano. And, uh, Anthony, you have done voiceover, film, radio, commercials, and television. Yes. So uh, great. Now, Anthony, can you tell us a little more about yourself and your career? Um, I guess I began writing as a child in, in elementary school and, and then again in high school, mostly short stories or plays. Uh, I think it helped that I always had a great imagination. I, I just loved to think and write about unusual things. And then I did a lot of theater in New Jersey um, and then some in New York, both off-Broadway and off-off-Broadway. Mm -hmm. And one night I was at the theater and I said, I should learn to do the writing myself <laughs> and then would give myself maybe better lines. So I, I set about learning how to write plays. I had written uh, short stories and felt this successfully for my own benefit, and I couldn't figure out how they did this, how they how they wrote plays. So I got a few of the classic plays. I studied some Ibsen. I had been an English major also, and studied some Ibsen, studied some Shaw, and I I figured out from a writer's point of view and an actor's point of view that I needed to have a show that would be producible. So I set about writing plays that have one set because when you do local theater you can't really have many sets you don't know how to change sets they're difficult to build and things like that and then i knew that in local theater it was mostly women so i set about writing plays that were 
mostly women characters and all one set. And um, the other third element of my plays is that I have um, usually a good monologue for each of the main characters in the play. And I did this because I know the people who choose the plays are often the people who act in the plays. Mm -hmm. So I, I wrote a play called Tap Dreams and um, had a, um, a reading. I know you talk about having other people read your work. Well, right. in plays, we have public readings where we invite the public. And I wrote a play called Tap Dreams about four women who sit in a tap studio and talk about their lives. And there's great feedback from the audience in, in that talk back. They really tell you it's really critical. I know you, you've been stressing that about the editor. Well, in plays, it's often the audience that tells you that on a, in a backstage play reading type of thing. And I sent it off and uh, a theater company in New York City called Love Creek decided to put it on and, and we had a little run there. And then it's been done in like England and Australia and right. South Africa. And it was very good. And I think it's because I, I came about writing from an actor's point of view. So I had the audience in mind, which I think is one of the most critical things to do. So is that your latest work or are you working on something? <laughs> no, that was, that's actually the first play I ever had produced. Uh, my latest work is a screenplay from a novel that I wrote uh, about um, a tall chat room. It was an idea for a play that I, I would have people on one stage, again, a unit set, where they would have uh, people would be on computers and in chat rooms. But that didn't seem to work as a play. And so I'm writing it as a screenplay. And it takes place in a university here in New Jersey where somebody has uh, infiltrated a chat room and is finding out about these people. And it's kind of like a drama type of thing. And it takes place in New Jersey in the present day. Okay. And where can people learn more about your work? Uh, my website is Giordano's Works, G-I-O-R-D-A-N-O-S. W O R K S dot com, or they can go to high stage, H I S T A G E dot com, which is one of my publishers, or they could Google me on Amazon or Barnes and Noble for my young adult novel, which is another boring summer again. Um, I guess those are the best places to find. All right. And I know that you share a name with one, um, a crime boss out of uh, St. Louis. <laughs> <laughs> I remember when I googled you. I'm thinking, am I googling the right person here? What? <laughs> no, no, no. Actually, the, the advantage to my name is that it's very, very, very common. So that, but people don't realize that. So when they hear my name, they often remember Giordano be, because they think they remember me. But it's actually just because the name is so common. But the other advantage is that it's so common that if I were somebody you didn't want to, who didn't want to be found, you couldn't find me just by googling me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hopefully, you'll stay on the line with us, and we're going to go into will. today's Thanks topic in a little bit. Oh yes, absolutely. If you are just tuning in, you're listening to Aspects of Writing with me, your host James Kelly, here on KLAB 12:30 on the AM dial, and on your computer, you can listen to this broadcast at KLAV 1230am.com. My next guest is James Anthony Ellis, and Jim is a writer, producer, and filmmaker living in Southern California. His book, Starting Point, A Guide to uh, Metaphysics, The Golden Time in Love, was initially published in 1989. Other books include Bread Comes, Poems, and Prose Designed to Lead You Home, uh, Life Traveler, and Tears, and Preparing for the Best, A Guide to Earth Changes in 2012. James also offers the creative um, collaborative and monthly newsletter that announces available writings, upcoming events, and anything he finds pertinent in the moment. To receive a copy of the newsletter or to contact James about the above mentioned items, see LegacyProductions.org. So what else can you tell us about yourself, Jim? Yeah, thank you. In fact, uh, when Anthony was speaking about uh, starting as a child, it just reminded me uh, the way I started as a writer is uh, for survival. Survival. I'm telling you, a lot of people maybe as writers may be able to relate to the idea that uh, expression is so important. And as a kid, I didn't have any avenue of expression except for the pen and any piece of paper I could find. So it was always <laughs> about just like getting my thoughts out, getting my feelings out somewhere. Yeah. So uh, that's where it started. And I ended up becoming, in, in my junior year in high school, I had a teacher walk up to me and say, you're good at writing. And for some reason, even as a junior, even with braces, even with terrible hair and acne, with low <laughs> self-esteem, total low self-esteem, I said, I know. And it was the first time I realized, <laughs> it was the first time I realized, wow, I am good at something. And it's just a natural gift that I had from there. I became a journalism major. But I don't know about any other journalism majors out there, but if you're a creative writer and you're in journalism, 
city council meetings are a dreadful, dreadful bore. So I decided, <laughs> <laughs> I decided to go my own way, just out of you know, just my own nature. Uh, after college, uh, to be a writer, of what comes through me, and it became uh, it was six books I've written, twenty plays produced in San Diego, three screenplays, and hundreds and hundreds of of, of poems. And so, uh, just very excited to be a writer, to be on this show. Uh, right now, I'm uh, working as a, a videographer as well. Somehow, writing became somehow I got a camera in my hand started filming, and then I started telling stories that way, and I, my last um, documentary, um, it's, uh, it's called Indoctrinated, The Grooming of Our Children into Prostitution. Now, that documentary oh. is right now going to be turned into a, a screenplay, so I'm excited about the, the topic for today. Uh, it's going to be an independent film, and it's based on the topic of human trafficking, or children mm. that are lured into uh, the prostitution life. And uh, so I'm excited about that. Uh, also, well, the last thing I want to mention is that uh, as a writer of books, you know, I basically write what uh, I'm living. And uh, what I've been living uh, as for the past uh, 15 years is being part of a men's organization that is really based on men being at their best. It's not. It's non-dominational, uh, and it's you know, it's not. Um, it's just based on you know, men. Being with men to reflect their own power, uh, so that they can be their best for uh, their relationships, their communities, and in that, uh, you know, and learning about leadership. And in those lessons, I ended up writing a book called The Honor Book, and that just came out in, uh, November third on my birthday. The Honor Book, and uh, very excited about that because I don't know another book like this. It's written directly for men. I know there's a lot of books out there for women, but it's just directly talking to men. And talking about integrity and the power of their word, the power of a man's word. Mm -hmm. uh, in the old days, it was their bond, it was everything, a handshake was everything. A lot of things have been lost in this day and age mm -hmm. uh, for the men. They've been lost. So this book is about really finding themselves, getting in honor with themselves and in integrity with their community and society so that they can be their best, be successful, and mostly be free. So that's, uh, that's a little bit about me and what's been going on with me. Well, it sounds like you stay quite busy. Oh, definitely. As long as I have a computer, it used to be a piece of paper and a pen, now the computer, as long as I have that and a chair and I sit down, it all works. And I also noticed when I Googled James Anthony Ellis that you have a few few names in common as well. And particularly yeah. with mugshots. <laughs> with, <yeah. laughs> Yes. yes, another part of my life. Right? Yeah, but you look nothing like those mugshots. shots. So. Okay. <laughs> All right, next we have on the show Jefferson Langley. Oh, first I would like to ask, yeah. though, uh, James, where can people learn more about your work? Yes, on uh, my website, uh, LegacyProductions.org. That's plural, LegacyProductions.org. Okay, and next we have on the show Jefferson Langley. And Jefferson, please give us a little bit about your background and what you're working on now. All right, cool. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity, James, and everyone. Such a cool, uh, diverse group. It's awesome. Um, geez, I've been in the film business about 20 years. Uh, originally was an athlete, played semi-pro soccer up until about 22 while, when I moved out to L.A. And uh, I guess there was always a creative type and, you know, kind of on the, on the down low, I guess you could say. And I came out to L.A. and started working for a lot of the bigger guys, you know, I worked at Tarantino's company for a couple of years and, you know, assisted, you know, big executive producers and directors, you know, Wayne Isham and all these big guys doing commercials and music videos and stuff. And then I went, I caught a, you know, you kind of hopscotch around and I went to propaganda and worked for Fincher and all, all those kind of guys. And, you know, I just sort of looked at it like a sponge, you know, I just sort of soaked up what to do and what not to do. And um, around 24, I, you know, was given an opportunity to start shooting things. One of the executive producers, you know, saw that I had a pretty keen interest in stuff and, uh, I started shooting shorts. You know, they, they supplied 35, you know, film and cameras and stuff and all I had to do was cover the insurance. And so obviously I started shooting a lot of really bad stuff and, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, and I just went, okay, these are the, these are the parts where I do everything that doesn't work and I'm just going to get it out now mm -hmm. and uh, you know it sort of evolved and I started getting you know some attention uh, you know obviously when there was time and 
I uh, shot my first feature at 24 that was in Slam Dance and got distributed in LA and New York. I picked up and uh, got picked up by a big agency and managers and all that kind of stuff. And I just didn't think I was quite ready for that kind. I mean, I had a two picture deal with Universal, a development deal. And I was, you know, I can't remember waking up sweating, you know, and thinking, you know, God, is, is this, is it already here? And so I sort of stepped back and went back to my roots and kept writing and shooting and uh, directing music videos and commercials for like Nike and Crystal Method and all that stuff. And, and then sure enough, it came back around again and started doing more movies and writing jobs for, you know, financiers. And I started a film fund with some investors out of Silicon Valley and uh, where we developed and were financing movies. And, um, I just, uh, you know, I ran that for about two and a half years and I felt like, okay, I've got it all now. I know the creative aspect. I know how to put it together. I know how to get the money together. And I uh, started moving on to all the things I'd been writing and sort of storing away and um, went back and got ripped by one of the bigger agencies and I was going out with movies. And and uh, I did another movie in 2011 called Not Forgotten with Simon Baker, the guy from The Mentalist, mm-hmm. and Paz Vega was in it. And Claire Forlani, she was a Meet Joe Black and a bunch of stuff. And um, that was distributed worldwide in theaters through Anchor Bay and Overture. And, um, you know, just, I guess, kind of say the rest is history. I mean, those are sort of the bigger bullet points. But uh, right now I'm working on, a, I'm putting together a package of a movie that's a contained thriller, high concept, sort of a, you know, they describe, people who read it go, it's sort of like Fight Club meets Inception. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And... Yeah, and it's uh, one location, seven actors, and, you know, deals with parallel worlds and, you know, interdimensional kind of connections and that kind of stuff. Uh, I have a book that I'm going out with right now called Trip in the Mind Fantastic. It's sort of a deeper look at, you know, what is the human experience and that kind of stuff. And, you know, just, so you know, I do the writing jobs. And I started a new venture called The Pitch Guru where I help people kind of modify their pitch and train themselves to really, you know, walk into an office and blow it out, you know. And um, uh, There's a big producer who sort of mentored me a little bit, and, you know, he told me, and he's done some, you know, billion-dollar blockbusters, and he said, you know, I know within the first 12 seconds whether I'm going to buy this or not. So I sort of took that to heart, and I went, all right, I'm just going to work myself to the to get myself to the 12-second, you know, ra- you know, 12-second hit, and... So people started going, you know, can you help me with that? And I just realized, hey, you know, there's something I can offer back. And um, that's, you know, that's kind of the gist up into this moment. Yeah, we're actually going to talk a little bit about how you, you know, how important those first few pages are. Oh, yeah, absolutely. All right. Where can people learn more about your work, Jefferson? Uh, Right now I'm revamping the website, but it'll be back up. It's uh, abethia.com, which is A-B-E-T-H-I-A. And then uh, you can catch me on Facebook, Jefferson Langley, L-A-N-G-L-E-Y, and uh, also The Pitch Guru also has its own page that I just got running, and uh, those are those are the three spots right now. Okay, and if you'll hang on with us, we're going to get into the show here in just a few minutes. Cool. I'm going to have Dana talk a little bit about herself. Dana's been on the show several times now. Uh, Dana, you're with us for the, the segment called Mentoring Jan, so can you tell our listeners a little bit about who you are and what you do? Um, well, basically, I'm a freelance uh, editor and ghostwriter. Um, I work primarily with writers, in this, and um, I work so far mostly with self-published authors, but I do have a few that um, have just gotten their books in with agents, so um, it's been a real learning curve for me. I was always writing, but um, the last two years with them, I've kind of been able to learn several aspects of the publishing business, so it's been great. And it's, it's, I think it's safe to say that writing is your passion because your training mm-hmm. is actually in law. You were an attorney, or you went to school to be an attorney. Yeah, I mean, I was an English major. Writing was my first love, and I kind of thought that law school was the safe way to go, so that's what I did, but um, wound up coming back to writing. Didn't, didn't, I, knew, I graduated, but I knew my second year that I didn't want to work for a law firm, so um, kind of, you know, I love to work with legal stuff and you know, if I can help someone out and give them, you know, legal advice, you know, not real legal advice, but I could say, check this out, Google this, whatever, or, or do writing for people that need um, quasi-legal expertise, I guess you'd say, but um, just never should have gone that way. It was kind of a, <laughs> you know, 
<laughs> detour, thinking yeah. it was the safe way to go. So. Mm -hmm. And Dana, where can um, people contact you if they'd like your services? Um, well, they can go to writersinthesky.com. They could also, um, well, actually, that's probably the best way. They can go to writersinthesky.com, or I, I'm also on Facebook. Okay, and you're going to stay with us today? Yes. Oh, okay. If you are listening, you, or if, you, if you're just tuning in and you're listening to Aspects of Writing with me, your host, James Kelly, here on KLEV, 1230 AM on the dial. And on your computer, you can listen to this broadcast live at www.klev1230am.com. Again, you can view us live at youtube.com forward slash Aspects of Writing. Just click on the Featured button. My guests today are Anthony Giordano, and James Anthony Ellis, and Jefferson Langley, and then Jen Corsi is here in the studio, and Dana Michelle is with us out of New York. Today's topic is writing for television movies and plays. A suge suggested software for script writing for movies and television and plays are, or this is my favorite, it's Final Draft. I don't know what everyone else uses, but I like that. Um, it will set you back about $175. That's followed by Movie Magic Screenwriter for about $149. Movie Online also for $149. And Montage for $75. Storyist, which I'm not familiar with, is $79. And Scripted Pro, you can go online and actually use their software for $9.95 a month. Is anyone familiar with any of the software? I've used Final Draft. Okay. I, re I really like that one. The other ones I'm not familiar with. Okay. James or Anthony? I use uh, Final Draft. Yep, Final sorry, Draft is Anthony me as well. Yeah, yeah Final Draft? Yep. Yes. Yeah. I've, I've used it a bit. I yeah. used it a bit. Well, the great thing about Final Draft is, is that you can use it for everything, whether it's script writing, plays, um, television, and even they have a part of the program set up for novels. So it's, it's a great – it's actually ranked number one. So. Uh, if you can't afford any of the software, there is one out there called Celtex. I've not used it, so if anyone has, please you know chime in. Um, it's, it's supposed to be a powerful free piece of downloadable scripts writing software. It functions a lot like Final Draft, um, and if you want, you can take things to the next level. Subtext also contains planning tools, storyboarding, and other ways to collaborate with an entire production team. I believe there is a, um, an upgraded version that you can purchase as well. Has anyone used Celtext? No. No? No. Okay. Nope. All right, writing tips. The 11 laws for a great storytelling for the movies from movieonline.com. Uh, the below suggestions are abbreviated excerpts from Jeffrey Hershenberg's recently published book, Reflections of the Shadow, Creating Memorable Heroes and Villains for Film and Television. Anthony, would you like to take the first part of that? Uh, sure. Uh, Jeffrey says that number one is assume everyone has ADD. <laughs> there has never been a greater truism in Hollywood, he feels. While he is guilty of playing dime store psychologist, he feels that one does not need a PhD in clinical psychology to conclude that audiences, and I think he's talking about every one of us here, mm -hmm. tend to have short attention spans. Uh, readers, like moviegoers, need to be entertained very quickly. And I think that's something we all experience. When we go to a movie, I mean, I've actually I've been, been to movies too. where people get up and walk out of the theater within the first yes. five or six minutes. Yes. So we I think it's true. I go ahead. Sorry. I think it's true. I think that uh, years ago, before film and before TV, people would listen to sermons for like two or three hours. Now, mm -hmm. uh, 10 minutes is a long time for any American to sit quietly and listen to someone talk. So movies and TV reflect that, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. And James, yeah. would you like to take the second part of this? Sure. Uh, the number, uh, number two is spend most of your time on the first 10 pages of your script. Uh, for example, in Gladiator, um, audiences are immediately engaged as they are introduced to the hero General Maximus and the respect that he commands from the Roman army. Um, you add an action-packed, bloody opening battle to the mix, and the people are sold. So uh, another example in Pulp Fiction, the first 10 pages of the script, they feature a restaurant robbery and the prophetic me uh, musings of the two unforgettable hitmen. This undoubtedly leaves uh, you wanting to continue turning the page. Uh, basically, when you're finished with your script, the, the idea is to give the first 10 pages to a group of your friends or family that you trust and ask each of them one very simple question. Do you want to read more? Yes. If, yeah, if the overwhelming response is, uh, is, is positive, then you're on the right track to writing a very memorable um, screenplay. Yeah, and um, this was brought up a while ago that, you know, how important it is to 
those first few pages are. You know, you really, I believe Jefferson brought that up, how important it is to have, you know, get the audience's attention right away. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, has, uh, I'm trying to think of a film, it had Jean, uh, uh, Bridget Fonda in it. I want to say something point. Point of no return. Yeah, point of no return. <laughs> I remember going to a movie with someone who probably shouldn't have gone to see that movie. And sure. within the first five minutes, I mean, it really is impactful, you know, with what's going on there. And she wanted to get up and leave. And I said, well, you know what? Just wait. Just close your eyes. <laughs> Forget all the shoot em, bang, bang up stuff and, you know, and wait. And just waiting, you know, to let all that happen, it was, it was really a good film, I thought. I don't know how anyone else feels about that film, but I thought it was a great film. Yeah. I don't recall it. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, it was, a, it was sort of a, re, a rehash of La Femme Nikita. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, Jan, would you like to take number three? Write roles to attract movie stars. Oh. Create a memorable hero or villain, and chances are you might attract a movie star to your script. Why? Characters like heroes and villains that are often unique, intelligent, and intriguing people with magnetism to spare. You may also want to watch the films that feature Academy Award winning uh, roles to get a better idea. And how does everyone feel about that? I mean, you know, it is important to have someone in mind, or I do. When I write, I usually try to have someone in mind when I'm writing. Jen, when you were writing a book, how did, how did you do that? As a matter of fact, almost... Uh, Two-thirds of my characters, I make references to particular movie stars that these people look like, sound like, and so that people really kind of can then in their mind's eye see what I'm seeing in mine. Anthony, how about you when you're, when you're writing plays? I always create the character first. I always create the person first. So for the first couple of weeks, I live with the person that I've created in my head. It may or may not be a movie star type person, but it's, a, it's some individual that I've created. And then I see how that person reacts to different life situations. And so then when it comes to script time, I can give that person a voice that's different than the other person that I've created. So I think this is right on. You have to have characters that people believe in. Mm -hmm. uh, and Jim, how do you feel about that? Well, actually, uh, one of the re uh, recent screenplays that I that I wrote uh, did have a certain character in mind because I really I, I like writing dialogue, and in the dialogue, if I could hear their voice, get a voice going, um, it's very helpful. And so, you know, the last uh, screenplay I wrote, I had a certain gentleman's voice in my head. I pictured him, and uh, you know, once it's complete, uh, you're sending it along. So yeah, it's good for me to picture it, hear it, and then if they're a star, it's uh, even better. <laughs> And Jefferson, I, I do agree. I mean, uh, I see it quite. I, I see it quite a bit, and from different aspects. I mean, even in movies that I'm just producing that I haven't even been a writer on, uh, it helps tremendously to know that in sending this in, you know, with an offer or anything like that, that um, that, that the character itself is some something or someone that they would want to play. I mean, what would you know? I mean, I, I've gone deep into it with the writers going. Why would Matthew McConaughey want to play this? I know you see him in this, but what what do you think would be intriguing for him? Well, it you know, like he's doing this movie, The Dallas Buyers Club, with Jared Leto, and you know McConaughey wanted to do something way outside the box, so he's lost like thirty five pounds, and you know, and it's all it all takes place in the nineteen eighties where he's playing, you know, they're they're AIDS victims, and you know, um, so it's you know you just have to you know. For making offers, it helps. It really helps to have some someone that they're, they're going to really attract to. Well, one of the things I find as a writer, too, is I actually have to believe in my characters. And one of the things I found that I used to do when I first started writing is, is that when I would tell my first story to someone, they would forget that I'm telling them the story, and they would end up asking me. I mean, I was talking to them as if these people were real. And they'd say, well, how do you know these people? <laughs> I go, no, no, I made them up. <laughs> they're not real. <laughs> Uh, if you are just tuning in, you're listening to Aspects of Writing with me. Your host, James Kelly, here on KLAB, 1230 on the AM dial. And on your computer, you can listen to us live at www.klab1230am.com. My guests today are Anthony Giordano, James Anthony Ellis, and Jefferson Langley. And then Dana Michelle is joining us from New York, and Jen Corsi is here in the studio. Dana, would you like to take number four? Sure. Uh, write economically. One of the most common mistakes you can make is overwriting. Keep your stage direction short. Jeffrey recommends trying to keep each paragraph to less than five lines and to the point. Never forget you are writing a piece of entertainment and stage direction should entertain as much as it informs us as to the comings and goings of your characters. 
And I think this is important no matter what genre you're writing in. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know so much about the plays, but certainly when it comes to writing books and, and television scripts, and even f or, I mean, and motion picture scripts, but even for television, you know, you do you can't overwrite. You know, you really have to stick to the subject and get the point across. Um, anyone have any comments on that? Yeah, this is Jim. You know, I, I don't know if you've all seen. Um, there's a certain segment of the Academy Awards where the best screenplay the past couple of years, for the best screenplay, they actually show a snippet of the film with the actual script written below, you know, as like, you know, below, the, the lines are below there. And when I'm watching that, like, that is some of the best teachings I've ever seen. It's like, you see the film, but then you look at the words, oh my gosh, there's only a few words. Mm -hmm. You could tell mm -hmm. that the writer, you know, the screenwriter has used the least amount of words to get the energy and the emotion across, and it's really seen and you can watch it with the, uh, the, the words below that. So I just, that's one comment I wanted to make. Well, I think one of the important things to remember here, here is that most scripts are between 90 and 120 pages. So when you're writing a novel, you, you have to more or less explain your characters and develop them and, and to keep people following along. But when you're writing a script, that's going to be visual. So you leave a lot of that direction or a lot of the, the visual part of it up to the directors. Um, am I right on that or wrong? Yeah, it's just like, I mean, for example, I mean, just certain film, I mean, the real popular and the real, you know, great writing is when the character can just say a few words and it's all in there. Like, there's so many layers to just a few words, you know, and also the visual that, you know, is an indicator in the, in the subtext is the indicator of where it's really going. But the few words point everyone there. And you really want people to feel something, so they're not going to feel it if you're telling them about it. They're going to feel it beyond the words. So you want to point to the words, the words below it, and it's, it's infinite. It's like a picture worth a thousand words. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe the, the, the latest film, The Artist, was a good example of that, where there was actually almost no dialogue in the movie, maybe one word. And I, I think sometimes people call that a silent movie, but I really don't think it's a silent movie because silent movies were movies where they actually spoke and they wrote the dialogue. I think this, this is just a good example of how the visual told the story when you didn't even need any words almost. Mm -hmm. Okay, Dana, would you like to finish with that? Um, with On the Nose? Yes. On the Nose dialogue. Several years ago, Jeffrey sent the script to his manager and received notes including quite a few pieces of dialogue circled with the comment OTN. Perplexed, he asked his manager to explain. His manager said there were several, several instances where his dialogue was too on the nose. The point is to make the audience work a bit for the information. Not too much. We don't want to frustrate them, but enough for them to feel emotionally involved in your story. Right. So that's sort of what everyone was just talking about. Um, Jefferson, would you like to take number five of this? Yes, number five. Make sure every character has a unique voice. Uh, movies work more, most effectively when they are populated with characters that are unique from one another. So you should try to avoid stereotypes. One of the problems with new writers is the depiction of characters who feel familiar and stereotypical. The key is to go against stereotypes, thus providing your audience with the refreshing read they crave. You know, surprise us with quirks and unusual traits, with something fresh and unusual about one of the main characters. It is that feeling of surprise we all desire, and unfortunately those moments are few and far between. And I don't know how everyone feels about this, but I think, for me, one of the best ways to develop a unique character is to get inside the mind of that character. Like, you do make them real in your mind, and then you have to say, well, what would this person really do? And I remember when I wrote my book, The Emblem, there was a character in there who's a villain, and he was a very, very bad guy. And he's one of those that he would tease or taunt his victims to make them think he wasn't going to really harm them, and then in the end, he'd end up murdering them. Um, and I remember as a writer, I'm thinking, I don't know if I can do this because if people read this, or especially the people I know who read this, they're going to say, how can you think like that? You know, it's like, who <laughs> yeah. are you? But you have to be the person. You, know, you have to put yourself inside the mind of that character, which is odd, but that's the way you have to do it. Mm -hmm. How does anyone have any comments? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, Jefferson, I, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. My main character. Oh, I'm sorry, Chad. My main character in, in in the book talks to herself a great deal, and at times when she should maybe put herself further forward and 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 say something when she's confronted with someone, 
she doesn't. She always backs off and just waits for somebody else to, to finish filling in all the blanks. And so that's her quirk. Yeah. And eventually she will get her voice. So, Jim, did you have a comment on that? Yeah, I was just, what popped in my head was thinking about, you know, just think about somebody in your life or think about yourself. In certain situations, you might be selfish. Or in another situation, you might be totally giving. You know, it really, it, you can't, it really depends on the situation and, uh, and what's being triggered in the moment. So if you have a character that is always selfish or always something, there's no real, um, you know, dimension to that person. So if the characters can be built in a way where they're responding to situations based on their backstory, that makes it very dynamic. And it's very challenging because I think stereotypes are much more easy to write. But if you can just make everyone, you know, have a backstory that, that helps them develop their reactions and responses to that situation, I think your script can be much more alive. Mm -hmm. Anthony, did you have anything to add to that? Uh, I agree that uh, if you make the characters a little bit more complex than a stereotype, the audience has something to do when they're sitting there to figure out what the next move will be. Otherwise, they have it kind of all figured out. And there's not much fun for them then. Mm -hmm. And Jefferson, did you have anything? Yeah, I was uh, it, I was looking at it from a, from a standpoint of you know I take I take it pretty far where I actually ask myself if I was that person what would I do and mm -hmm. it's it's a, to me it's a powerful thing to learn about myself as well while I do it so if I if I'm willing to admit to myself that I'd be willing to do whatever say a villain or a good guy uh, would do for me it comes from a truthful space. You know, so it has an energy on it that that says this this is real because there's someone admitting that they would do that if they had to or if if the circumstances were in front of them. So um, I, I get that a lot when I go into pitch studios. Or, you know, the the executives do ask me. You know, this is this seems personal, and I go, well, let me put it to you like this: if that were me, I'd do that. <laughs> well, I I, ha I see a little problem here in that my character actually <laughs> taunted with the character, made her think that she was going to be raped, and then turned around and bashed her head into the side of a tub. So I would like to think I would not think that way in real life. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, it, it, that's the beauty of it is I can, go as, I can go as far as I can and not actually have to do it. Right, okay. Uh. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'd also like to add, create some someone an actor would love to play. Um, one can only imagine Julia Roberts' reaction when she read the script for Aaron Brockovich. It is simply not the, the typical role of, afforded to actresses in Hollywood. The hero of the film is quintessentially strong, a strong character any actress would love to play. She is competent, bold, and sympathetic, and has plenty of memorable mo monologues. It is a classic underdog story resulting in Roberts winning the Oscar in 2000. Uh, transfer him or her over your story. Rick Blaine in Casablanca is a great example of a hero transforming over the course of the story. At the beginning of the film, he com confidentially states his mantra, I stick, I stick my neck out for nobody. But at the end of the film, he does just that, sticking his neck out for the woman he loves. So it's okay to have a character that you, know, you can present as strong in the beginning of a book or movie or play or whatever and then for whatever reason that can alter because in life we do that we all yeah. change you know based on our that's what happens to my character yeah no? she completely changes at the end hmm? mm -hmm. and does anyone have anything to add to that well that's a great this is Jim that's a great foreshadowing is to have a character uh, claim something in the towards the beginning of the movie or like quarter of the way through claim that this is who they are but then the arc of the story you know, it's shown that that was just one layer to them. And that is, uh, that's a really great technique to use is a foreshadow of something like that. And then have them change and then show that that was just maybe even a barrier to them. So. And there again, writing writing is a mirror of life because we do all have more than one layer, um, and it depends on our circumstances as to which layer you see. So it, it, it really is important to delve into yourself, you know, like Jefferson was saying, and, and bring that forward when you're writing your characters. And if you're worried about writing your characters and they have to change, that gives you a reason to have plot in your story because you have to have some reason for them to change. So sometimes it's difficult for writers to come up with, well, just what is going to happen in this story. But if character has to go from A to B, you have to think of a situation that will make that happen. Right. And that, that assists mm -hmm. with your plot development, I think. That's true.
Anthony, would you like to take number six, understanding your audience? Sure. Um, understanding your audience. When you are writing a screenplay, there are two audiences you should consider. One, the readers, the agents, the managers, the producers, and the studio executives will be reading your screenplay, a.k.a. the buyers. And two, the demographic you believe will be most interested in seeing your movie. If your script is a comedy, it must be funny. If you're writing a horror script, it must be scary. Sounds like common sense? Well, it is. Talk to a professional reader and ask her how many comedy and horror scripts she has read of late that are actually funny or scary. The comedy scripts are scary and the horror scripts are funny. <laughs> the answer you might read. <laughs> the re regarding demographics, Hollywood studios like to categorize the world into four simple compartments, typically referred to as quadrants. One, male under 25. Two, male over 25 three female under 25, and four female over 25. If you ever wondered why every Pixar film seems to make a billion dollars in worldwide gross and ancillary revenues, it is because the company excels at making four-quadrant films and that appeal to equally to males and females under 25 and over 25. You know, I would like to comment a little bit on what you were talking about where you were reading when it says writing a horror script must be scary. Sounds like common sense. Is, well, um, I don't know how many of you have seen the play Evil Dead or the movies. No. But no. <laughs> the first one was actually supposed to be a serious horror film. But it was so horrible, it was laughable. It was just silly. Right. So they took that, and they, and, and they were smart because they realized you know, as it was so horribly produced, people mm. liked it. So now we're going to continue this as a farce, and it worked. And, you know, it, that's when it actually the second one and the third one were more successful than the first because they took what was supposed to be serious, a serious horror film in the beginning and made it funny. Is that how they come up with Airplane and all those other crazy – That I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, it wasn't – this is Jefferson. Wasn't Evil Dead Sam Raimi? Yes, I think so. Yeah, Sam Raimi, who you know, Spider Man, and you know, all mm -hmm. these. Um, yeah, he's very well. He actually started out in horror. Well, and it, it, if you haven't seen the play, the play is hilarious too. It's a oh, spoof sure. on all the movies, and it's just unbelievably funny. Uh, James, would you like to take number seven? Sure. This is uh, know your three act structure. Uh, you know, like it or not, Hollywood has a language all its own. Here's what buyers expect from your script. By page number 10, they want to be introduced to your hero, what he wants, his goal, and the genre of the story you are telling. By the end of Act 1, which is page 25 or so, the readers want to know exactly where this story is going, including the stakes, which is what happens if the hero does not achieve his goal, and the villain, you know, that person, the place or thing, preventing the hero from achieving this goal. Now, by the midpoint, you know, the middle of Act 2 or page 55 or so, the readers like to feel that the stakes for the hero have been raised in some fashion. Maybe a new character has been introduced, maybe a new obstacle or villain has reared its head. Maybe the hero has experienced a distinct character transformation. By the end of Act 2, which is about page 90, the readers presume your hero will be in a heap of trouble. Uh, I think this is also known as the setback for mm -hmm. some people. Up until now, the hero may have been steadily moving towards his goal, but at the end of Act 2, things have changed. He has suddenly been put in a corner, and the audience is asking itself, how in the world is he going to get out of this one? Uh, in Act 3, the last act, readers want your hero to somehow devise a new plan and escape from the mess that has presented itself at the end of Act 2. This is also called the big finish. And what is everyone's take on this? Jefferson? Uh, as far as the three-act structure and all of that? Yes. Uh, I, I, I do think it works to a certain degree. I mean... Uh, the buyers are definitely, you know, coming from that space. But I also know just from being out there and, you know, hearing the voices, you know, it's sort of like how far can you bend it? So, it, you know, knowing these things is all sort of the guidelines and then it's up to you to know how far you want to push the edges. And um, I know they're all looking for some, you know, please someone do something different, you know. And, uh, you know, so if you're able to kind of keep your feet in both sides of the fence, you know, where you still maintain a certain level of, you know, what they're used to seeing, but then in spots where you, you know, calculatingly choose, you know, to bend it, I think that's where you really start to get noticed. You know, that's that's from my experience of what I've seen and heard. Um, but, you know, typically the, the three-act structure does, you know, hold its water, so to speak. Anthony, how do, what do you think of this? 
I think from an audience point of view, if the audience has seen many, 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 many movies and they're all in this format, they kind of expect it in some way. So I agree that it would be great if you could get out of the format a little bit and do something a little different. But when you go to a movie, you have certain expectations. And one of the expectations is that it's going to kind of follow this format. Even if you don't know what the format is, you kind of subconsciously know it. So I would think that it would be a good idea to try at least to adhere somewhat to this idea. Um, it would be great, of course, to have a little take on it, a little little change on it. But I think the audience kind of expects it. It's like when you go to, uh, you know, the old story of when they did, um, what is it, How to Succeed? No, no, um, funny, uh, on the forum, the forum. The, the play the form. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, they, they, it was a, a bomb out of town because the audience didn't know if it was a comedy or not. So then they wrote a song. It's a comedy tonight. And the play became a hit. <laughs> and the song is only there to tell the audience because they said nobody knows whether this is a comedy or not. A uh, uh, funny thing happened the way the form. And they wrote a, play, wrote a song called it's, it's a Comedy Tonight. And then it was a hit because the audience didn't know what to expect. So when you're, when you're bending it too much, you're out of, the, out of the mainstream. But if you could bend it, by, as the other guest said, that would be ideal then, because then you have both the best, the best of both worlds. All right. We're winding down here, so I'm going to have Jan go right to number <laughs> eight for us. Be aware of theme and keep it consistent throughout the script. Theme is a tough nut to crack. When Jeffrey asks his students the theme of Die Hard, they often restate the film's core concept, or in a Hollywood terms, the log, log line. Uh, saying something like, it's about a cop thwart, thwarting a group of international terrorists while s saving his wife and a bunch of innocent people. While this is true, it doesn't quite touch on theme. I then dig deeper, suggesting Die Hard is really about a man trying to reconnect with his wife. True, this reconnection takes place amidst the backdrop of action-packed Hesting. Uh, but it is the core. This is the story about John McCain. McLean, uh, discovering the importance of family and love and appreciating appreciation he has for his wife, Holly. So the pitch so is important. You know, how you yeah. pitch it is very important. Dana, would you like to take number nine? Sure. Uh, watch and rewatch successful movies similar to your story. There is an old adage in Hollywood that they want the same but different because the average studio picture costs over $100 million to produce and market. Studios are in the average, in the risk aversion business every bit as much as they are in the movie business. The impact on you is that these buyers' products tend to gravitate towards the familiar, stories they think will have the best chance at attracting a global audience. I think one of the things we see t happening today is the independent films are, are taking away from that structure of packaging a film because people want to do something that's independent and different and Hollywood does have demands on this is what they want this is what they expect um, so you're seeing more and more independent films being produced because you know everyone wants to do it their way uh, does anyone have a brief comment on that Jim or Anthony or Jefferson well so, yeah I mean as, as far as the theme and what and what um, you know, I mean, I know the average studio movie. You know, I mean, we're st it, what you're seeing now is you're starting to see a lot of in the twenty range. You know, the twenty million dollar range, which is kind of this new pocket that's been been invented. You know, with the movies like Taken. Um, you know, Taken Two did really well. Uh, yeah, they're, okay. There's the you know the hundred tent pole kind of things, but you know, you're you're starting to see a lot of these movies come out of the gate. You know, and um, what they're finding out is is that you're able to deliver the same kind of uh, material and format enter the same kind of audience but at a lower price with the same component so they're sort of scaling it down to a certain level mm -hmm. and um, you know because when you, you get into theme it doesn't cost a hundred million dollars to say a man trying to save his marriage with his wife you know and his children you know that doesn't cost a hundred million dollars right. what costs a hundred million dollars is blowing up the you know the Nakazaki Plaza or whatever <laughs> <laughs> you know yeah. um, well so so, I mean, what independent film did is it broke apart the grip that it was completely run by the studios. Mm -hmm. 
And you know, that's when you see, start seeing all these mini mini majors pop up and well, you know, mini production companies who well, can finance their own stuff. You know, Jefferson, we're going to wind this down. We have one minute left, and I, you know, I appreciate everyone being on the show. I wish we had more time. I'd like to thank Anthony Giordano, James Anthony Ellis, and Jefferson Langley, as well as Dana Michelle and Jan Corsi for being on today's show. And to find out more about my guests, please visit the the links page on my website at www.aspectsofwriting.com. Aspects of Writing broadcasts live every Tuesday at two o'clock p.m. Pacific. Standard Time here on KLAV 1230 on the AM dial. And you can listen to this broadcast live at KLAV 1230AM.com. This show rebroadcast every Tuesday at 8 o'clock p.m. Pacific Standard Time on VegasAllNetRadio.com. Our past shows are also archived on VegasAllNetRadio.com. Uh, to view the recorded visual version of this show, go to YouTube.com for, forward slash Aspects of Writing on your computer. This show will be posted immediately after this broadcast for future lineups. Log on to www.aspectsofwriting.com. So until next time, this is your host saying, James Kelly, reminding you, if you can dream it, you can write it. Thank you, everyone, for being on the show. Thank you, James. Work. So join us for Aspects of Writing right here on KLAV. Weather is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Today, partly cloudy, high 67, low 47. Tomorrow, partly cloudy, giving way to sunny skies in the afternoon, high 70, low 46. Introducing Progressive's exclusive snapshot discount, a program that tracks your good driving and rewards it with discounts. Find out more at Progressive.com. You are saved in the name of Joshua the Messiah. This is Valencia Dantzler, a.k.a. Mother Diva, and I want you to join me every Sunday at 5 p.m. for the Gospel House Music Bible Series. Know your creator, learn the pattern of the universe through the Holy Scriptures and nature, and enjoy fabulous Gospel House music. Matthew 10 and 34 says...